So now we'll move over to the basic operations of a computer. Well, let's remember what our basic computer is like. From the last lecture, we said that a basic computer comprises something like a very simplified block diagram, as we can see here, where we have the control and data path. That's basically, you know, the, 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 uh, the center of our CPU, the control logic that tells us what we're about to do, and the ALU, which does the actual mathematical operations. We have the program counter, which is pointing to the instruction memory what the next instruction that we have to run is. We have the general purpose registers that basically hold all our operands that we're going to work with. And we have the instruction memory and the data memory, the tightly coupled instruction and data memory that are going to be um, used for giving us the next instruction and for um, storing different types of data that we're going to be needing to use. So we're talking about risk machines, which are mainly load store architectures. And that means that we do all our um, operations directly on registers. So we may have an assembly command such as add x1, x2, x3, which would be mapped to um, register x1 gets the data in x2 plus the data in x3. And that would mean we have some sort of ALU, some sort of an adder that's going to get two source operands, which are going to be these x2 and x3. It's going to produce a result, which is going to be stored back into register x X1, and it's going to have some sort of a, of, of a control code that's going to tell us what to do um, if we should do an add or some sort of other type of operation. So to do this type of um, basic operation, what are we going to need? We're going to have instruction fetch that's going to go from the program counter to the memory and get what our next instruction is. It's going to go and see the instruction and see that we have to use you know, these three um, registers over here, x2 and x3 and x1. So we need to access our register file. And we need to go and execute our operation in the ALU. Type of C code that we could see for such a thing is um, f, uh, variable f equals g plus h minus i plus j. And if we were going to take it over into some assembly code in uh, the RISC-V assembly, it would be something like add x5 gets x1 plus x2. So that would be, you know, this part over here. x1 and x2 would be storing g and h, and they would be stored into x5. Then we'd have add x6 gets x3 plus x4. So x3 and x4 would be i and j, and they would be stored inside x6. And then once we have x5 and x6 as our um, you know, partial sums over here, we could subtract x6 uh, minus x5, something like that, and store it inside x7. So that's the type of thing that we'll see how C code is then going to be compiled into assembly code. So let's start um, building our data path with these three components over here. Let's go over them to build, you know, a basic operation in a basic computer. So we have to start with this instruction fetch. Um, instructions in RISC-V are all 32 bits wide. Okay, so for every instruction, what we need to do is we need to go and we need to fetch a one 32-bit word. So we'll have our uh, program counter. It's going to provide the um, address that we need to read from. It's going to go into the instruction memory and bring out our instruction. Um, then it's going to go and move to the next instruction, which is 32 bits later. So it's going to increment it by four bytes. So this program counter will also go into an adder that will be uh, have a constant 4 added to it, and that will be um, written back into the program counter. So that's a basic type of thing that we need for instruction fetch. The instructions come in a number of formats. So really what they did in RISC-V is they thought about each and every bit inside these 32 bits to optimize the placement of these bits so it will help us implement the hardware very easily. Easily, For example, we have the opcodes which tell us what the instruction is supposed to do. They're all going to be in the bottom seven bits, and that's going to really help us just take the same exact bits to the decoder that's going to go and see what each of these instructions has to do. So if it, they would be scattered through different places, places inside these 32 bits, it would make the wiring much harder once we were going to place and route this type of uh, instruction. But since they, they decided that they would all be in the same bits, it really helps us reduce the number of muxes and so forth. So there are four, uh, four major instruction formats. We'll see that there are a few more, but they're just basically variations on these four. And they're the R format, which R is named for register. And this is a kind of format that has two source and one destination operand. So if we look at this, and these are not necessarily the bit placements, but these are the number of bits that make it up. We have this opcode that's going to be stored, as we said, in the bottom seven bits. But then we have three operands. So they're going to be two source operands, RS1 and RS2. There are each going to be five bits because as we'll see in a little bit, we have 32-bit 
uh, 32 um, registers. And so we need five bits to uh, tell us what the address of these registers are. And we're going to have a destination register. And we have another 10 bits that um, you can see here are called func7 and func3 that we can play around with to give different types of variations and additional um, operations to this type of a format. We have the I format, which is going to be called the immediate format. And it has only one source and one destination, as you can see here, RS1 and RD. They're the source and the destination um, registers. And it's going to use these 12 bits over here um, for a constant, which we call an immediate, because it's immediately available within the uh, instruction itself. We have the S and B format, which are very similar formats, so we kind of consider them as one. And they're going to have two source uh, operands, RS1 and RS2 over here. But instead of a destination, they will not need a destination. They will use the, the 12 bits over here for uh, the immediates. And finally, we're going to have the U or J formats. J is for jump. And they, again, are very similar. And so we are considering them as one format. And they're only going to have a destination. And they're going to use 20 bits for an immediate. And so we're going to see in the next few slides why and how we're going to use these things. So let's look at the second step, which is now register file access. So as I mentioned before, RISC-V has 32 registers, and that's the Goldilocks principle. Um, different architectures have different numbers of registers, but um, using the experience of many of these different architectures, the designers of RISC-V decided that, that you know, if uh, we want the perfect amount the porridge is too hot, the porridge is too cold, this porridge is just right. They wanted the right amount. And if you have a smaller number of registers, it allows us to have faster access. But if we have too small, it's going to make you know our code larger and other problems, we're going to have to store things into memory. So 32 registers is kind of a Goldilocks point where the porridge is just right. Okay, these registers, they're numbered X0 to X31. Actually, we only have 31 registers because X0 is defined as hardwired to zero. So we use zero so often in types of uh, uh, machine code that instead of having to load zero the, into one of the registers and then do uh, uh, operations between registers, they decided we would just take this X0 and hardwire it to zero. So you don't really need flip-flops there. It's just uh, uh, wires that are connected to ground. All the other registers, they're equivalent and they're general purpose. So you could use them for anything. And that's why they're just called the same thing, X0 to X31. Um, actually, there are 32 registers because there's also the program counter, which is another register that's, uh, but it's not exactly general purpose, though. It's another, you know, uh, 32 or 64 or whatever flip-flops, okay? Um, as I said there, these are named X0 to X31, but in reality, that really is kind of confusing. It doesn't mean anything. So um, what they do is they try to give meanings to these different registers, and that is done in another layer on top of the basic ISO, which is called the application binary interface. You could have different application binary interfaces, but the basic one um, is what I'm showing here, and that's what I'm going to be using throughout this lecture. And it gives certain registers assignments. So we have things like X1 being the return address, so we're going to call it RA. And X2 is going to be the stack pointer, so we're going to call it XSP. X3 is the global pointer, GP. We're going to have the frame pointer. We're going to have different registers that are supposed to be used for return values, different registers that are supposed to be used for arguments, and therefore we may call them A0, A1, etc. Um, temporary registers and saved registers. So you can see a breakdown of the different um, names of the ISO, what the name of the register in the X's is, is over here, and what its ABI is and its description is over here. So a register-to-register -register operation requires us to do something like this, add x1, x2, x3, as x1 gets x2 plus x3, as we saw before. So we need two source operands, these x2 and x3. We call them RS1, register source 1 and RS2. And we have one destination operand, that would be this x1 over here, so that would be RD. Okay, that means we have a register file that needs two reads and one write within, you know, a single cycle. We need to have this type of a special type of a memory that is not just a single access to a single address at one time. It needs to have this two read, one write um, operation. Okay, so we get, you know, two read register addresses, one write register address. We provide the read data from these two source operands and we um, write the write data into the write uh, register. Okay. For this, we use the R format. As we said before, that's the register format because it's talking about register to register operations. And as we saw here, we have these two source operands and 
um, one destination operand encoded in here. And we have the extra 10 bits where we can, you know, um, encode all kinds of other things. Okay. Um, there is a different op uh, option where we could uh, provide arithmetic for with a constant. For instance, we want to just increment the value inside some sort of register. So we would want to take the register value and add one to it. So for example, um, we have an operation here like add i. And when we add an i, that means we're doing an immediate. So if this is an add between two registers, this is an add between a register and an immediate. So this is some sort of a constant. And um, therefore, we uh, are going to get, you know, x1 is going to get x2 plus some sort of a constant. And so we only need one source and one destination. We don't need the second source. And we'll use the additional um, space over there to encode an immediate. That's what the compiler is going to do. And that's why we have the I format or immediate format. So it's going to take just one source and one destination. But instead of having the second source up here, it's going to use that, um, that opcode space for uh, encoding, you know, a bigger constant. So we can have, you know, two to the 12 um, values over here um, as our constant that we encode always inside here. Just another little quirk of the RISC-V, um, they understood that really we're going to have to do sign extension a lot of times. For instance, this immediate is going to go into a 32-bit ALU, and therefore we need it to become not a 12-bit operand, but a 32-bit operand. So we need to sign extend, um, considering that we're using uh, two's complement usually. So bit 31 is always defined in all the different formats as a sign bit. So we just need to take that bit, put it into the sign extension unit, and use it for sign extension. It's not going to be scattered all around, and we'll have to between the bits. So the third stage of our basic, basic, basic operation is the execution. We um, fetch the instructions. We um, access the register file. Now we need to do our actual operation. So which operation do we perform? So we saw that in the R format, the opcode is 7 bits and the registers are 15 bits, three, uh, three registers with 5 bits each. That means we have 10 bits left over. That's this func 7 and func 3 where we can encode whatever type of operation we need to do. Um, uh, first of all, that. And second of all, with the opcode. Okay, in the I format, we have 7 bits um, uh, and we have 22 bits for the register and for the immediate. Uh, so we have another 3 bits left that we can play with. So we can really encode things in the opcode and in this extra space that was left to make different types of variations on that. Okay, so we can use this to do all kinds of things like select the ALU operation or other control, and we can really encode 1,000 different instructions with a single R format opcode because we have these 10 bits where we can encode different things. And you can see something like this. If you have your ALU, you can give some sort of a control bus over here and um, encode different things in the bits that go into there that say that this is an AND function, an OR function, add or subtract. And this is just a type of an example of how you can implement these things, but it could be uh, with many Many, many more things. You could, again, have a thousand different operations just using these 10 bits over here. Okay, so what are the R format instructions, the register, register instructions? We have add for uh, doing addition. We have sub for doing subtraction. And then we have different shift, shift operations, shift left logical, shift right logical, shift uh, right arithmetic. We do not have a shift left arithmetic. It is not needed. We also have these bitwise operations, the and, or, and XOR. And we have a set less than operation, which will set the output if um, uh, the first operand is smaller than the second operand. Um, then we have immediate format instructions. These are registers with immediates. They are add immediate, and immediate, or immediate, XOR immediate, and set less than immediate. There is no sub-immediate instruction, and the reason why is that you can just add a negative. So we can take something if we want to um, subtract an immediate from a, an instruction, we can just add minus that instruction. And the, the immediate is signed, and therefore we can do that very easily. So in this case, x1 equals x2 minus ox123 just by putting this constant as a, uh, as a negative. So we saw above that the ALU provides a variety of ways for bitwise operations. And this must might, may be clear for somebody who's used to uh, programming embedded systems, but just somebody who's done basic programming does not usually use these types of bitwise operations. We have and, or, XOR, and, I, or, I, XOR, I, shift uh, logical left, shift uh, right logical, 
um, shift right arithmetic, set less than, and set less than immediate. So those are a lot of these bitwise operations which are very kind of strange, and we put a lot, lot, lot of instructions that we um, define in the instruction set architecture to implement them. So um, if you look into C, it also provides these type of operation. There's a, an AND operation, there's an, uh, an OR operation, a XOR operation, a NOT operation, and SHIFT operations. So why are these needed? And the main reason that we use them is what we do is we mask selected bits to be altered. So let's give a bunch of examples that we can see over here. So first of all, if we use an AND with a whole bunch of ones and just one zero, what we can do is clear a selected bit. So for, if, for example, if we put you know, um, OXE over here, um, then we get one, 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 and zero. And what that means is that these, um, uh, these bits will just be copied. A and one is just gonna be A, B and one is just gonna be B, but D and zero is always gonna be zero. So it will clear a certain bit, it will turn a certain bit into zero, which is something that we may wanna do often. Similarly, we can clear all but the selected bits by um, putting everything as a zero and then just one. So that would be OX1 in this case. Okay, and therefore A, B, and C will all be reset to zero, but D will be ended with a one, so it will just go, um, it will continue being the same. So we can clear all but the selected bit with this type of a mask. Another type of mask is using an OR where we can set a selected bit of A. So if we use all zeros and just one on the bit that we want to, um, uh, to set, then all of these just stay the same. A or zero, B or zero, C or zero, they just stay the same. But D or one, uh, it will become a one uh, regardless of if D was a zero or one before. So that's for setting a certain bit. And finally, we have an XOR, which can be used to invert a selected bit. So here, if we um, XOR with zeros, they're not gonna change. But if we XOR with one, we're gonna get the not of that, um, of that bit. So D, if it was zero, it would become a one. And if it was one, it would become a zero. So using an XOR, we can invert a selected bit. So these types of things are very common and they include setting and resetting bits on a microcontroller output port, testing status bits on input lines or in registers, setting and resetting status bits as a result of some operation, making comparison operations, or quickly performing multiplication and division with these shift operations.